Okay. So, hello. Good morning Hi. to each and every one of you. So, welcome to this edition of Philosophy and What Matters, where we tackle what matters to us from a philosophical point of view. I'm JJ Joaquin, a philosopher here at De La Salle University, and with us is our good friend, Alan Hayek. Our first discussion will be on counterfactuals. So what are counterfactuals? So think of it this way. I, might have, I would have been in Canberra right now if had it not been for the pandemic. You would have been in some other place had it not been for the Zoom interview. But what do we mean by those things? So may, may I present Alan Hayek, a professor of philosophy at the Australian National University. He will be our guide in tackling this particular question. Oh, by the way, Alan and I have been friends for 10 years now, so let's start. Right. So what are counterfactuals, Al? Okay, now for start, think of them as sentences. And in English, we typically express them using the subjunctive conditional form, you know, if it were the case that A, it would be the case that B, you know, Hillary Clinton nearly won the presidential election, but she didn't, you know, perhaps she would have won if there had been no Russian influence, okay? If there had been no Russian influence, she would have won. There's a counterfactual. Mm -hmm. uh, if she'd campaigned harder in certain states, she would have won. There's a counterfactual. And presumably, you know, her regret uh, about <laughs> the election is informed by such uh, counterfactuals. So, so first think of counterfactuals as sentences that we typically express in English in the subjunctive. In fact, I, I want to ask you, uh, the interview's going in both directions, whether Filipino has the subjunctive form and uh, do you express counterfactuals in a no. parallel way the way we do in English? No, I think so, because our conditionals actually are in counterfactual form. So our an antecedent part are already in the negative formulation. And there we're, we're thinking about the consequent in terms of that antecedent. So, so yeah. then that maybe good, thank you. So that maybe brings me to the second important thing to, to bring out, a distinction between counterfactuals and so-called indicative conditionals. And again, in English, it's easy to bring that out and, and I'll ask whether the same is true for Filipino. Okay, here's the classic pair of cases. Counterfactual. If Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy, someone else would have. That seems false. It's uh, unless you think there was, uh, you know, some conspiracy and there was a backup gunman and something. That mm. seems false. Okay, that's the subjunctive. Indicative. If Oswald didn't shoot Kennedy, someone else did. Now that seems clearly true because we know someone did and you know, there's some controversy over whether it was Oswald. Mm -hmm. If Oswald didn't do it, then someone else did. That's the indicative. And notice how in English the mood changed. I switched from the subjunctive to the indicative to capture this different uh, flavor of the conditional. And we sometimes say that the indicative corresponds to a sort of epistemic conditional. It's to do with, you know, your state of information. Mm -hmm. The counterfactual, by contrast, is supposed to be worldly. It's supposed to be about how things are in the world, maybe its dispositions or its laws of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a modal notion that we're attaching to the world itself. So that, that I think, is the good setup. Okay, so there's a distinction between indicatives, what we know so far about the world, then you have the counterfactuals, which are facts in the world, and we're playing around with those facts when we think about counterfactuals? Well, we, uh, we're imagining, uh, we keep fixed certain facts about the actual world, mm -hmm. and then we, we're entertaining certain changes to the actual world, and what would ramify from that. And th the game here is to try and work out, like, what do you hold fixed? Right. Uh, what, because we, we don't, it's, it's not just like complete chaos reigns, you know, it's not like anything goes, you know, if, if Clinton had campaigned harder, she would have been a unicorn. You know, there's, we, you're constraining mm -hmm. how we think about these hypothetical situations. Uh, but we do so in a different way to the way we do uh, the indicative conditionals. 
uh, yeah, so that's that's the sort of setup. That's the the, the sort of beast that we're trying to <laughs> to understand here. Okay, yeah, and it's it's quite a beast. I mean, there's been a history like going back to the ancient Greeks. They even worried about uh, conditionals and uh, uh, even the even the crows on the rooftops are crowing about which conditionals are true. That's what Callimachus said. <laughs> and you, know, you had the old Stoics like uh, Chrysippus and Diodorus uh, worried about the truth conditions for conditionals. For conditionals, right, right. So this has been go uh, this study has been going on for well millennia now. How about contemporary yeah. philosophers thinking about this? So who Good. are yes. the the people here? Yeah. So interestingly, I, I would say there was really quite a long <laughs> gap, like a couple of thousand years. <laughs> It didn't work much on conditionals. And then there was a revival in the 40s with people like Goodman and Chisholm. And, uh, for example, soon after that in the 50s, Goodman's Fact, Fiction and Forecast had a central chapter on counterfactuals and, and the problem of giving truth conditions for them. And, mm. then, and then I would say that the heyday, well, first of possible world semantics came... Mm soon after that, especially in, in the 60s, uh, thanks to especially Kripke's influence. And then I would say the golden era of study of conditionals, and now we, let's focus especially on counterfactuals. That was starting in the late 60s, this classic debate between Stallmacher and Lewis. We'll talk about them more uh, in a moment, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stallmacher had a classic paper, A Theory of Conditionals, and then Lewis's classic book, Counterfactuals, offered a sort of rival theory uh -huh. to Stallmakers. And then that was the golden, golden era of, of counterfactuals. Now, let, let me also add, uh, as, as you know, Lewis was one of my PhD supervisors. I know, and, I know. <laughs> yeah, which, which was fantastic. He so, once told me, yeah, yeah, okay, so, and, and I'll say something, go, you go ahead. Yeah, so I remember you, uh, Telling me a story about David Lewis once you were accepted in Princeton, right? He yes. called you. He yes. called you at home and he said that, hello, Al, Alan Hyatt. Yeah. Yeah. You've been accepted to Princeton. Is that, yeah. is that the story? Did, did I get the but, story? Well, that, that is the story. That, can you imagine <laughs> that this, this momentous moment in my life, you know, I'd been on <laughs> I applied to Princeton. And, you know, I was fast asleep. It was early in the morning for me on Saturday morning in Melbourne. He was in Princeton Friday night and he, he called me. And this was just a life-changing <laughs> moment. <laughs> it's a, that's a long story which we could tell, tell later. But, but, yeah, that was my first meeting with, with Lewis and he was tremendously influential on me and, uh, you know, a wonderful supervisor. And he mm. told me regarding counterfactuals, the reason why he wrote that book and, and he wrote these classic papers about counterfactuals, in a way it was not first because he wanted to, to tell us about counterfactuals. He wanted to give an account of causation. All right, all right. In terms of counterfactuals. He wanted to give a counterfactual analysis of causation. Mm -hmm. And he was concerned that people would think, well, hang on, counterfactuals are not on secure footing. That's a sort of shaky foundation for causation. So Lewis felt pressure to firm up the foundations, namely to give this rigorous analysis mm -hmm. of counterfactuals, and then he felt free to, to go on and use them in the analysis of causation and other things. Right, but, uh, right. Very interesting. That was his, his order of thought, and uh, that's what motivated him. So he's starting with causation first. He's trying to figure out what cause and effect relations are then he figured out that, ah, I could analyze this in terms of counterfactuals. Is, is that yeah. the thing? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, he, he needed the notion of counterfactual dependence. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, a, if the cause hadn't happened, the, the effect uh, would not have effect happened. Would, would not have happened. Yep. Notice, notice how we use the counterfactual there. Right, right. And, and, and they both happened. And causation is, is, involves chains of counterfactual dependence in, in his early account. Mm. But, so he needed to shore up the, the account of uh, counterfactuals. And, and notice, by the way, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about this soon, 
in his analysis of counterfactuals, he talked about possible worlds. Right. Uh, possible <laughs> worlds were key to, to understanding counterfactuals. And there were worries about possible worlds too, you know, even though they'd been appealed to in these, you know, very you know, semantic uh, theories, it wasn't clear what they were. And so mm. he went on later to write this classic book on the plurality of worlds. To defend to, your po yeah. to defend to defend this, pos possible worlds view. Right. So we, we, before, before we get mm -hmm. into that, let's yeah. go back to counterfactuals again. So yes. why, why do counterfactuals matter? Yeah. Why should Excellent. we think about them? Yeah, uh, so many reasons. For a start, uh, we as philosophers care about them. Uh, in a way, the uh, analysis of causation from Lewis, that, that was just part of, again, this golden era of counterfactuals and people just started analyzing all sorts of things and they still do in terms of counterfactuals. So just think of how all the things that we hold dear that philosophers whip out the counterfactuals to, to understand, you know. So I said causation, but perception, knowledge, mm. personal identity, laws of nature, rational decision, like causal decision theory, mm -hmm. confirmation, dispositions, free action, explanation, the direction of time, and so on. So counterfactuals keep on being implicated in these other things. So that, that's the first answer that we as philosophers care <laughs> Or yeah, yeah, okay. And it's not just philosophers, you know, science traffics in counterfactuals, uh, sometimes explicitly, like in drawing out consequences of its theories. For example, I, I, just, I just looked up, a, there's a physics textbook problem. Uh, if you were to drill a hole all the way through the earth and then jump in, <laughs> uh, <laughs> how, how long would it take you to get to the, the other side of the earth? Mm -hmm. and, and what would happen? And the answer is you, you'd become this harmonic oscillator. But anyway, notice how I said it in terms of a counterfactual. You know, right. if you were to drill this hole, how fast would you uh, travel? How, how long would it take? Uh, so science, and science uh, appeals to concepts that are maybe tacitly counterfactual, for example, dispositions. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, social sciences, uh, counterfactuals are earning their keep in history. You know, what a certain thing happened, what would have happened, you know, for subsequent history if it had been otherwise. Uh, we mentioned regret with psychology. <laughs> uh, by the way, a bit of personal psychoanalysis. I think the reason why I'm so fascinated by counterfactuals and one reason why I want them to come out mostly false <laughs> later, okay. is I'm so prone to regret, you know, I, I, I'm prone to regret and what informs regret are usually counterfactuals, you know, if only I hadn't done this blah, blah thing, things would be better. You know, I would be happier or whatever. I regret that I did that thing. Mm -hmm. So you're so psycholo psychologizing the thing here. Yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> I think counterfactuals are really important in our psychology in that mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. uh, regret, well, relief, mm -hmm. relief likewise, you know, oh, I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, there were no problems with our Zoom connection now. You know, if, if we'd had troubles with the Zoom, this, this would not be going smoothly now, but here we are, it's going smoothly. Mm. Uh, that's relief expressed <laughs> in terms of counterfactuals. So, you know, a lot of our mental <laughs> uh, economy is, is used up. Uh, yeah, yeah, using counterfactuals, they're expressed, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, that's why we should care <laughs> about, so yes, as your nice slide says, why does this matter? I've given you several reasons why it matters. No, so let's go back to the sciences first. So we know we yeah. are in a pandemic. So modeling is some sort of yeah. counterfactual, if you think about yeah. it. So what would have happened if we have set the conditions in the following way? Is, is that exactly. the same thing? That's a good example. That's right. So I'm hearing a lot about these coronavirus models. You know, mm -hmm. if we were to you know, lock down things to this extent, what would be the effect if we were to not lock down at all, if we were to make no changes? Uh, for example, they, they said in Australia that uh, if, 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 there'd been no, if there had been no intervention, and notice the counterfactual, mm -hmm. you know, there, there would have been uh, about 20,000 Australian deaths mm, by wow. now. Uh, in fact, there's been roughly 100. And so that, that's supposed to indicate the efficacy of 
government's <laughs> interventions, you know, the right. lockdown right, is a good right. thing, is, is, is the claim, because things would have been so much worse if we hadn't uh, intervened. God, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so counterfactuals are involved in our reasoning about many yeah. things. So right. how do we understand counterfactuals? Let's go to the theories of counterfactuals. Excellent, yes. So how do you analyze counterfactuals in a philosophical way? Great. So, so maybe I'll start by saying how not to analyze them, and then that'll give us okay. uh, a bit of motivation how we should do it instead. So here's the first thing you might try. Uh, now, if, if your students have done a, a bit of logic, then they probably know about the so-called material conditional. So that's, that's the analysis of if then, yep. uh, which has a truth table. And sure. the truth table is, is, is very simple. It's, it's true on every line, except where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And by the way, I, I, I hope everyone's clear on this terminology. Uh, the first part of the conditional, you know, if P, Mm. The first part is the antecedent, then Q, Q is the consequent, and I'll be using that terminology a lot, okay? So the truth table for if P then Q, the so-called material conditional, is true in every case except where you have true mm. antecedent, false, consequent. P is true, Q is false, and that line is false. Okay, okay. now why am, I, why am I saying this? It follows from that that counterfactuals, namely cases where the antecedent is false or presupposed to be false, mm -hmm. the paradigm cases, uh, would come out automatically true, all of them, on this analysis. And that seems wrong, you know. If, oh, right. if, if uh, you know, if there had been no Russian influence, Clinton would have won true because there was Russian influence, we're imagining, that's the whole point. Uh, <laughs> may, maybe that one's okay to come out true, maybe that's what one thing she, she's upset about. Mm -hmm. But if, if there had been no Russian influence, she would have been a unicorn, true, because <laughs> it's false that there was right. no Russian influence. Okay. Uh, and if, whatever you like, stick in the consequent, all of those things would come out true on the material conditional analysis. And that, that's crazy because uh, counterfactuals presumably are more discriminating than that. They don't just sort of vacuously go, go true just because their antecedents are false. Mm. Okay, so that would be a bad analysis. So we don't use material conditionals to analyze no. counterfactuals. Okay. That's right, that's right. Now, something else you might try. Uh, now I'm going to introduce a bit of modal logic. Mm -hmm. you, you might say, the material conditional, it, it mustn't just be true, it has to be necessarily true. Mm -hmm. And we, we symbolize that with a, a box, box and the city right. operator out the front. So you might say the truth conditions are necessarily and then the material conditional. And uh, I actually like that analysis and maybe later on we'll talk about that. But anyway, mm -hmm. the, the first worry that people have about that is now you have the opposite problem, it seems. Now most counterfactuals will, will come out false mm -hmm. because it's very hard to make this necessity claim true. Basically, it, it's saying all of the P worlds are Q. All of the worlds where P is true are worlds where Q is true. And that's very demanding. Okay. That's, that's the thought. Okay. So then now we finally get to the positive uh, <laughs> th theories, which, which are, you know, more orthodox where the conditional, the counterfactual is sort of somehow intermediate between those two things. It's not the material conditional. Supposedly, it's not the strict conditional, conditional as well, right? Either. It's, it's something in between. So we, we need to talk about that. Now, I need to say something about possible worlds. Is now the right time for me uh, to, to do that? Yeah, before that, I'll just summarize. Yeah. So Wait, yes. we want to analyze counterfactuals. We need to understand them. So yeah. one bad suggestion, one bad analysis is in terms of material conditionals. Yeah. Because counterfactuals would turn out for a uh, two. True. Too easily, yep. Yeah. Yep, too easily. Then it the bad another bad analysis is in terms of strict conditionals. So you have the yeah. modal modal operator in the conditional. Because, well, no counterfactual will be 
true in that. Very, very, kind of very few of them. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's the orthodoxy. I, I actually like that account, but yes, that, that is what people okay. normally say. Yes. So, so, yeah, that's right. that's so we want background. something in the middle that we could capture yep. some true counterfactuals, at least we, yeah. we inevitably we suppose as true counterfactuals, and we rule out some false counterfactuals as well. So we need that yeah. middle ground. Yeah, the sweet spot in the middle. That, that's okay. Yeah. So let's yeah. go to the, the analysis, the standard analysis of counterfactuals now. Good, that's right. And it is typically presented in terms of possible worlds. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I should just say a little bit about possible worlds, uh, and then we can, we can give the analysis Stolnacker and then Lewis. Uh, possible worlds, that, that's a topic in itself. We could go for hours just on, on them, but think of, them, <laughs> think of them as ways the world could be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we know one way the world could be, it's the actual world. Here it is, right? But it, the world could have also gone some other way. You know, Cl Clinton could have won the election. She didn't. Mm -hmm. The actual world, she lost. But in other worlds, we can imagine, she won. Okay, so think of possible worlds as ways the world could, have could been. be. Okay. Could have been or could be. Uh, now, you, you might sort of think of them, but they're a little bit like lines of a truth table, you know. Uh, here, here are different combinations of truth values of the key components, okay. But for various reasons, it seems worlds are sort of richer things than that. People sometimes think of them as maximally consistent sets of sentences. Uh, I think I'll just fast forward to Lewis, because we, we, we want to talk a lot about Lewis. Uh, his famous, notorious <laughs> account of possible worlds is that they're concrete, they're real, you mm -hmm. know, just as real as the actual world, you know. <laughs> they're concrete not just things, right. Concrete things, they're not just abstract objects, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, but they're spatio-temporally isolated, causally isolated from each other. Uh, there is a world in which Clinton, or as he would say, a counterpart of Clinton, mm -hmm. won the election or the, the counterpart of the election. Uh, we can't get there from here. There's right? no There's access. No, no access. There's no spatio-temporal no mm. route from here to there. But it's out there, so to speak. It exists. It's just as real as the actual world. All that's special about the actual world is that we are in it. Uh, it's this sort of indexical analysis, you know, that it's like here and now. Mm -hmm. It's actual, uh, but it could easily be different. And for other, other people, it is. So that's his modal realism, as it's called. And he, he defends this modal realism, uh, well, in a few ways. But the main way is he calls it philosopher's paradise. If, if you just spot him, this plurality of worlds, then a lot of benefits, philosophical benefits mm. follows. Now you can give elegant analyses of various things like, you know, propositions or properties, mental content, uh, as we will soon see counterfactuals. So, so he will claim. So he says that it's a little bit like believing in numbers in mathematics, you know, Cantor's paradise. You, you should believe in numbers because when you do, you get this beautiful theory. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. you know, if you believe in possible worlds, you get this beautiful theory. Metaphysics, uh, right? You get, you get beautiful metaphysics that ha handles all sorts of problems. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly uh, just, just just mention a couple of, or maybe three, famous objections to Lewis's counter modal realism. I, I, modal realism. And, okay. Then, then we'll move on. Uh, well, there's what he famously calls the incredulous stare. You know, like. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> uh, what do you mean there's there, there in fact, it, it, just to, to emphasize how strong his modal realism, realism is, it's not just that there's, you know, one or two other worlds. There are infinitely many mm -hmm. other worlds that they, they really exist. And in fact, it's, it's a big infinity too. It, that, that's another topic. But, so it, it's like a huge ontological commitment mm -hmm, right the right stare, the incredulous <laughs> stare is basically come on you know common sense doesn't countenance you know the reality of these other worlds you know there's only one world here we are the actual mm. world and uh, this is just a way of speaking then there's 
And then there's sort of an epistemological problem. It, it, it resonates with a problem that Banasarov raised about in, in mathematics. You might say in order to know about something or to have rational beliefs about something, you, you need to be causally connected to it. But, but remember I said a moment ago that Lewis individuates the worlds by their, their internal causal connection, but they're isolated from each other. You can't get there from here. Right. You can't send signals to another world. Okay. Uh, so you might say, hang on, how, how could we ever get to know about these worlds if they're causally isolated? isolated from right. Us? Okay. Right. Uh, but, but here's a, a, a brilliant reply, I, I think, uh, in another connection. That seems like that principle seems to overgeneralize. If you say you can only know about things if you're in causal connection to them, or you know that they have causal effects on you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I his, see where this is going. His his uh, <laughs> his is great. I think counterexample. Mm. Think of the the whole of history, like all all of space time and all events in it in the whole of history. Okay, we we believe in that. There is such a thing as that but it has no causal, causal connection. <laughs> no causal connection to us, no causal connection to anything because it, right. it, it's all entire. Causal, you know? <laughs> all causation happens within it. Right. It right. Anything else. So that's a good, good case of something that it seems we should believe in, but not because we're causally connected to it. Uh, one last problem. And then, then we can move on. Uh, Kripke had this famous argument from concern. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his example concerned uh, Hubert Humphrey losing his election, but we could make it Clinton mm -hmm. just as easily. Uh, as I said, Clinton has a regret. You know, she wishes she had whatever, campaigned harder in Michigan, blah, blah. Now, Kripke's objection is, well, but Kripke, the, the object of Clinton's concern is not uh, some a counterpart, remote, <laughs> a counterpart in some right. other spatio-temporally, causally distant, you know, remote, uh, unconnected, uh, possible world. You know, she, she, what she cares about is, is here and now, and you know, her concerns. Her, yeah, in the actual world. So, right. so how bizarre that, according to Lewis, her the object of her concern is this, you know, causally remote you know, individual. That looks like her, right? <laughs> exactly, that's right. But again, uh, there's, I think there's a really strong reply to that objection. Uh, well, okay, th that might be a worry for, for, you know, the modal realist account, but it seems like it's even a bigger worry for the alternative accounts, like, you know, where a possible world is some abstract object, like, say, a, a maximally consistent set of sentences. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not like Hillary Clinton is concerned about some abstract object, you know, it's not no, like she's okay. <laughs> maximally consistent. <laughs> right, right. So, so uh, that, if, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. If this objection is any good against Lewis, it's even stronger, I would have thought. Against, against the abstract. Uh, yeah, those who believe in abstract are right, right. That, exactly. That's, that's right. it. So, okay, that's the setup. So, so JJ, I think. We, we've set up the sort of uh, position nicely. Now mm. we can finally give the analysis of counterfactual. Okay, yeah. so but, let's get into that. So just a summary. So counterfactuals, we want to understand them. And one way of thinking about them is in terms of possible worlds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have given Lewis's position, modal realism, that, well, those possible worlds are concrete objects. Okay? They exist, yeah. but... Uh, we're costly isolated. Uh, they're costly isolated from each other. Now, yep. the, the, let's set aside the metaphysics, con uh, the metaphysical concerns about possible world. Now, let's use it in understanding counterfactuals. Let's start with uh, Bob Solnaker's theory. Perfect. Yep. Excellent. Oh, so wait, uh, wait. remember so, I said. Uh, so, Al, do you know Bob personally? Yep. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, okay. Can you tell us yes. something about him? Oh, a terrific <laughs> guy. I, I, I got to know him fairly well a couple of ways. Uh, I had a visiting uh, position at MIT mm -hmm. for, for a while, and he was, of course, there and, and you know, a central figure in the department. And I, I especially uh, got to know him better 
I, I taught at this Budapest summer school on conditionals. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he was one of the, the professors there. And that, that was a wonderful time, one of the, the highlights of my academic life, actually. Uh, and uh, various people were there. Uh, Jason Stanley and Barry Lower organized it. There was Angelica Kratzer. Mm -hmm. uh, the linguist. From Dorothy the Edgington. Yeah, sorry? The linguist, Angelica Kratzer? Yeah, yes. Right, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And earlier, I, I should have probably mentioned her as, as well, you know, in the, in the history of the study of counterfactuals and conditionals more generally. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked about philosophers, uh, but there's been, and Edgington, who I also just mentioned now in, in Budapest, was also important. And we might come to her views later about uh, no truth values and a probabilistic account. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, linguists like Kratzer, uh, have been very important in the study of counterfactuals and, and conditionals generally as, as well. Von Fintel as well. Yeah, right, anyway, right. so, so the Stolnacker, he was one of the, the people at this summer school and uh, it, was, it was great to get to know him better there too. Okay, so his account, I, I think we, we're ready. We've introduced possible worlds, but we need one other notion, uh, a notion of closeness mm -hmm. of worlds. And I'll, I'll maybe try and convey that intuitively and then we can maybe get more rigorous about it okay intuitively so take something that's true of the actual world so my example is uh i i'm not i i don't i'm not really up up to speed on you know who, who's cool in music these days you know but, <laughs> but by my example will involve britney spears and you know the her she had this song whoops i did it again that's so uh, 90s it's so 90s, I'm sure that dates me, doesn't it? Oh, you're but, right. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So, so okay. Britney Spears made famous this song, Whoops, I Did It Again, in the actual world. That's true. Someone else could have, and we can imagine more and less sort of similar worlds accordingly. So, for example, you know, Madonna could have made that song famous, and that, so to speak, that doesn't involve a big departure from actual history. You know, that's, that's fairly similar. Mm -hmm. you know, Frank Sinatra could have made it. <laughs> that, that's not, not, okay, not too okay. ridiculous, I guess. Okay. Uh, how about, you know, me? I, maybe I could have made it famous. Well, that, that's getting a bit, bit more bizarre. You know, I'm, I'm not a great singer and I'm, I'm not, not a famous singer. But okay, yeah, I suppose I could have made that song famous. Uh, one, one of my dogs, you know, Laddie. Laddie could have made it famous. Oh, hang on, that's getting pretty pretty bizarre. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> uh, this, you know, this this uh, desk that I'm sitting at uh, could have made it famous. No, now we're really getting bizarre. You know, an electron could have made it famous. Okay. The number, okay. Seven, the number seventeen could have made it famous. <laughs> All right. So somewhere things started going pretty crazy, and, and eventually I think we're shading off into impossibility. Mm -hmm. But along our route there, we were considering more and less similar ways to the actual world that these worlds could be. Okay. Now, so, so in, in that sequence, for example, I had, you know, Madonna making the song famous. That, that was a fairly close possible world. It wouldn't require much of a change to our world to, to have her making it famous and Frank mm -hmm. Sinatra fairly close and then then it started shading off more and more bizarre okay so we let's just start with this intuitive notion that we have a sort of ordering of worlds according to how similar they are to the, to actual, the actual world okay. okay okay now and finally uh we can state intuitively Stolnacker's theory if it were the case that a it would be the case that c a for antecedent c for consequent that's true if and only if C is true at the closest A world, the closest world where A is true, or mm -hmm. as we might say, the nearest, or as we might say, the most similar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. world where A is true. Uh, and now we can also relativize that to a particular starting world, call it W, okay? Now, uh, always good to have a picture. Uh, I don't exactly have a whiteboard here, but I can I can draw a picture. I don't know if you'll you'll see this, but uh, if I if I draw like this, do you see me? That's meant to be a line. Yeah, you mm. can, I, 
if you can yeah, see that. We can see well, it. Let's put, the, let's put the actual world, let's say there, and that's the little symbol for actual. And now we're imagining worlds ordered, as we might say, linearly, according to how similar they are to the actual world. And so in my, in my example, you know, a fairly close world, say this one. Madonna. Would be Madonna and here's Frank Sinatra making it famous and here's me and, and it gets more and more crazy. Mm. Uh, so Stolnak is basically saying, if you want to evaluate A, and here's the symbolism, box arrow C, Mm -hmm. I think you can see that yeah, you go can, to yeah. the, starting at the actual world, you go to the closest a world and I mean, let's imagine it's here and then ask is C true at that closest a world? If the answer is yes, then yeah, the no, counterfactual is true. Yeah, if, right. if, if he's false, then it's false. Okay. So you, you look at the closest world where the antecedent is true. Now, so that's that's the view. Now, I I should quickly get to a couple of objections to it. But to, did you want to stop me? Yeah. So yeah, my yeah. my question is first. So I'm thinking about Stolnaker's theory. So there's a kind of ordering of worlds. Yep. The similarity relation or the nearness relation is determined by how close the possible world is to the index world or the actual world in our case. Right, yeah. Yeah. so the farther away the the world is, it's not something that we should consider in our analysis, or it makes a counterfactual false under this analysis. And the near, or, yeah, yeah, you you always you always uh, consider the closest world where the antecedent is true. The antecedent Maybe is true, right? If if sometimes the counterfactual forces you to go a long way out because the antecedent itself is very far fetched. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but even then, you you always try to stay as close as you can to the, the actual, actual world, world. or yeah. whatever yeah. the world we're considering is, right? So the index yeah. world, if we're the index world, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And now now Stolmacher does this formally in terms of what what he calls a selection function. But I I'm trying to convey the intuition. Right. Uh, right. It's something about resemblance to the actual world mm -hmm. that, that we we're, we're trying to maximize. Okay. And I, I want to not only talk to you about counterfactuals, but I also want to share with you some philosophical techniques. <laughs> uh, and actually some of them I learned from Lewis himself. Mm -hmm. And so right now, he, here's a good one. Because uh, I, I have this other project, what I call philosophical heuristics. heuristics right. Various tool, tools of the trade that we use. For some reason, we rarely teach them. We teach mm -hmm. logic. We have all these <laughs> other techniques. Anyway, so here's a good one. Uh, in philosophy, if someone gives you an analysis of something or, you know, some claim that involves the word the, see the word the in neon lights <laughs> and, and watch out for a certain kind of problem. There are two, so the X typically comes with a presupposition. There's exactly one X, the X. Mm -hmm. Well, there are two ways that could go wrong. There could be multiple X's. There could be two or three or many X's. Mm -hmm. Or, other way, there could be zero X's, not, just none yeah. at all. Okay, that's two, two things that you could try. So if someone hits you with an account of something that has the form blah, 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 the X, blah, 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 think, ah, <laughs> does, does this account survive objections from these two sides, multiple X's or none? Okay, so let's, let's go back to the Stolnacker analysis. And now I'm going to say it with a bit of emphasis. Uh, this will be my, uh, my neon lights mm -hmm. uh, in my presentation. So again, if it were the case that A, it would be that C. That's true, according to Stolnacker, if and only if C is true at the huh. nearest world. Okay. Nearest. Nearest A, a world. world. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, he's presupposing that there's exactly one. There's mm. a unique nearest A world. Okay. So what does Lewis do? 
He objects, objects exactly as I said on either side. He thinks there's a problem on uh, the, pl the plurality of nearest A worlds. A worlds. <laughs> not all A worlds. So mm -hmm. an example of that, if Bizet was French, Verdi was Italian. If Bizet and Verdi had been compatriots, they would have what? Been Italian? Or, or why, French. Why, it would have been French, right? Mm -hmm. or, or maybe they maybe they could have been Swiss, like maybe they could like met you know in the middle or something. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the the worry is that uh, there could be multiple closest A worlds, mm -hmm. nearest A worlds. Okay, so then this presupposition of uniqueness would fail. All right. Still okay, so that that's an objection on that side. Now the objection on the other side. Remember, was maybe there are no closest mm. a worlds how could that happen lewis has this nice example maybe you've got an infinite sequence of closer and closer worlds but none closest and here's an example uh if i were taller than seven feet or maybe mm -hmm. i need to make it make it metric you know these days so, that's all right it. that's all right we it's get that seven feet. you can make uh. it two meters <laughs> if I were taller, taller than seven feet, how tall would I be? Well, would I be seven foot one, one? inch? Well, that seems like a gratuitous departure from my actual height. Mm -hmm. A little bit closer would be more similar. You know, seven foot half an inch would be closer. Seven foot quarter of an inch, closer still. An eighth, like a, an infinite sequence of ever closer worlds. None closest. So there's no closest world, right? And that's the objection on the other side. Right, right. So that's that's pretty cool. So, so uh, I, I'm trying to figure out the the objection against Solnaker's theory. So, Solnaker's yep. theory implies that a counterfactual is true if and only if the closest uh, a world, yeah, is where the consequent is true. That's it. Right. So that's the idea. So the nearest a world. So the objection will be against either the uniqueness of the nearest a world or the existence of the nearest a world yeah uh, yeah okay yeah okay that's, so that's right it's, you said it well yeah. okay so we're we're thinking about stalnager uh, does lewis offer an alternative to uh stalnager's yeah. theory yes so let, let's go there let's go to he, lewis's theory he does, and it's supposed to take care of these objections mm -hmm. and uh, probably let, let's let's dive into it this way. Here's here's probably the fastest way to say it. Uh, don't don't presuppose that there's a unique closest or nearest mm -hmm. a world antecedent world. Consider all of the closest a worlds. Mm -hmm. Okay, if if all of them are C, then the counterfactual A would C is true in okay. all those worlds now, yeah okay <laughs> that's right so it, it's a kind of necessity it's it's saying all of these closest antecedent worlds are consequent worlds uh, so maybe saying it's a little bit more carefully i i'll try drawing another picture now <laughs> the the picture is not is not the linear the order line. okay the line uh, let, let's let's make another picture Think of it more like a bullseye. You've got the actual world. By the way, I, I talked about philosophical heuristics. A good heuristic is draw a diagram. Diagrams are always good for focusing the mind. Okay, actual world. Now, imagine kind of rings, like a bullseye diagram, around the actual world, which represent uh, similarity uh, similarities where there are ties. So, for example, I, I, for example, I imagined Bizet and Verdi being compatriots. There's the Italian way and the French way, and they might be equally close to the actual world. So maybe I could draw it like this. Uh, here is, they're both French, and here is, they're both Italian. Mm -hmm. And what these spheres, these circles are supposed to convey is that they're equally distant mm -hmm. from the actual world okay so according to the lewis analysis 
uh, you've got to make sure that all of the closest worlds are con antecedent worlds or consequent worlds. And the way he, he says it, uh, the way I would put it is start at the actual world and start heading out. And you're going to further and further uh, more, more dissimilar worlds as you go out. As you, as you go on this, this path, you hit A and C worlds earlier than you hit A and not C worlds. Mm -hmm. So you hit, you hit A and C worlds, like for example, maybe here, before you hit any A and not C worlds, then A would C is true. But that's a slightly harder way of saying that the way I did it earlier, just think of it as all of the closest A worlds are C and that'll, that'll do. No, no, I, I think the circles are helpful here. So instead of thinking about it in terms of a linear measure, so yep. we're looking at it for multiple dimensions, like from mm -hmm. here's the actual world. So here are some other possible worlds. So yep. if those A, in those A worlds C is true, then the counterfactual would be true. Yeah, if, yeah, if in all of them, then the counterfactual is true. That's right. right. So, so the idea will be uh, we could have multiple candidates for the, the A world, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, that's, I think that's a, a, a nice way of putting it. So, how does it apply to counterfactuals? Can, can, can we give an example? Okay. Uh, so, we, well, let's revisit. Let, how about we do the, the, the Bizet and Verdi one? Okay. Uh, if Bizet and Verdi had been compatriots, they would have been Italian. Mm -hmm. Think of that, okay? Intuitively, that's false, I, I think, and, and Lewis thinks, because why Italian? You know, French would be just as live a <laughs> possibility. <laughs> right, right, okay? right. But, and so it's, it is not true that starting at the actual world and going out to less and less similar worlds. It's not true that you hit compatriot worlds and Italian before you hit compatriot worlds and French. No, mm -hmm. on the contrary, you, you, you hit them at the same time. You know, they're, they're equally distant mm -hmm. from the actual mm -hmm. world. Okay, so it's not true that all of the closest compatriot worlds are Italian worlds mm -hmm. because some of them are French worlds. Okay, that's, that's the key idea. Now, I don't know if I should start with some of the objections. That, that case seems to work out pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, some other cases won't be so good for Lewis, I think. No, let's try to figure out first the Lewis idea. Sure. So I think right. there's, a, there's a move from a wood counterfactual to a might counterfactual. Yes. Good. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to bring that up. Okay. Uh, Okay, remember, so would behaves a bit like necessity. Mm -hmm. it, it means that all of the closest P worlds, that now P is the antecedent of before it was A, are Q. All of the closest A worlds are C. Um, might behaves like Possible. possibility. Right. And, it, it, and it's, a, it's an existential quantifier. It says there exists mm -hmm. a world with a certain property. In this case, it would be some of the closest A worlds are C. Some of the closest antecedent worlds are consequent worlds. Okay. Right. And then, then that's the dual of wood. It, it behaves very much like necessity and possibility in modal logic, you know, box and diamond. Okay. And, and in fact, Lewis explicitly interdefines them. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, wood is, mo is not might not. Right, so like uh, necessities are not possible not. Yeah, that's it, All right. that's it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as long as there's at least one closest antecedent world mm -hmm. uh, where the consequent is true, then that, that's good enough for the truth of the might counterfactual. So let's do it for Bizet and Verity. If they'd been compatriots, they might have been French. Mm -hmm. That seems true, right? Right. Which is to say, among the closest worlds where they're compatriots, there's at least one French world. They're both French. Right, right, and right. Intuitively, that's right. There's also a closest world where they're both Italian. That's fine. That, they might have been Italian, too. 
but uh, we wanted to get right that they might have been French. So, so maybe a way of putting it simply is might counterfactuals are very easy to make yeah. true, mm -hmm. okay? And I say, especially, woulds are correspondingly hard to make true because they require all, this un all of them. They, they yeah. require this universality, this necessity, mm -hmm. and, and that's more demanding. Anyway, yeah. so that's, that's the Lewis, Lewis account. Yeah, so we're, but we're still not thinking about counterfactuals in terms of strict conditionals, right? Quite so. Excellent. Uh, we uh, noticed that we said all of the closest mm -hmm. antecedent worlds, all of the closest A worlds. We didn't say all of them, full stop, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, a strict conditional, you know, remember that has the form of a box, a modal operator, then conditional. conditional. And it, so that, that, the way to understand that is all of the antecedent worlds are consequent worlds. Mm -hmm. I didn't say all of the closest, I just said all, right. period. Right. But, so in that sense, you, it seems like the strict conditional is stronger because it, it's, it's quantifying not just over the closest antecedent worlds, but over all of them. Now, you, you might say, well, we can, we can sort of talk of different strict conditionals, like uh, we, we could, confine ourselves to just the most similar, the closest mm -hmm. worlds. And then it, then it almost seems like a terminological point. You could say, well, I, when I, whenever I say all, I mean all closest. <laughs> and then, then it sort of collapses to the strict conditional. The way Lewis put it was the counterfactuals are variably strict mm -hmm. conditional. They, they're strict conditionals in a certain sense. They involve this kind of necessity, all of the relevant worlds. Uh, the uh, uh, consequent worlds, mm -hmm. but it's variable because it, it depends on this notion of similarity. Okay. Yeah. Change the similarity relation and you change which are the closest worlds mm -hmm. and you check which are the true counterfactuals. So, so he, his thought was that the counterfactuals somehow intermediate in strength uh, between the strict conditional and notice it's definitely not, the uh, material conditional where that oh. you only look at the actual world, you know, yeah. or all of the actual world, the only one. <laughs> we have <laughs> only one world. <laughs> is, the con is the consequent world. That, right. that uh, it's controversial whether that's a good analysis of the indicative, but it, it's not controversial. That, that would be a very bad analysis of the counterfactual. Right. Only look at the actual world. So Lewis, it has this sort of intermediate view that you look at a, a lot of worlds, but not all of them. And yeah, you so, check that the comes true. Okay, so how about impossible antecedents? Excellent, excellent. So, okay. so that, that's especially relevant here because remember, uh, there was this presupposition, we're start, starting with Stolnacher's theory that there was a unique closest mm -hmm. antecedent world. And we, we, we worried about that in, in two ways. Now, another way that could fail is if there are just no antecedent worlds at all. I mean, mm -hmm. forget about closest antecedent worlds. There are none of them. Namely, the antecedent's impossible. It's just not possible for A to be true. So there are no A worlds, period. Mm. Right. Of course, there are no closest ones. There aren't any. And, and this is an issue for both Stolnacker and Lewis. Now, when I gave the truth conditions for each of them, I, I elided over this extra clause that they need when there are no possible antecedent worlds at all. Mm -hmm. And they both say that the counterfactual just becomes vacuously true. It's like trivially true. If you can't quantify over any A worlds, A, A worlds, because there are, there are none, mm -hmm. uh, any, any counterfactual A would see comes out true, vacuously true. It, it's, it's so to speak true at all of the, a worlds, all none of them, as Lewis used to love to say. <laughs> <laughs> so it's trivially true that, for uh, let's give an example. So if I say, had two plus two been five, then I would have been in somewhere else. How, yeah. how, would, you, how would you analyze that kind of? Concept? So if, if two, yeah, right. If two plus two had been five, then. Uh, well, some things that are intuitively true may be true, like mathematics would, would look a bit different to what we're used to. Right. Uh, if, you know, if, 
if, if, if two plus two equaled five, then I guess two plus three would equal six or something like that. <laughs> Did I say that right? Two plus two is four, two plus two, two plus two is five, two plus three is six. You know, mm -hmm. Maybe that doesn't sound so crazy. But uh, if, if two plus two had equaled five, then, you know, uh, Clinton, Clinton would have been a unicorn. That's true. In Lewis's account? In Lewis's account, vacuously true, trivially okay. true, because there are no worlds in which two plus two is five. Mm -hmm. So at, at all of them, all well, none of them, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's true that uh, she's a unicorn and, and not a unicorn and whatever you like. So mm -hmm. you, there's just no distinctions to be made. But, but then some people think that's the wrong answer. Namely, uh, it seems that there are intuitively uh, false counterfactuals uh, of that kind. And in fact, I, I think I've got an ex example or two here. Uh, mama, yes, Daniel Nolan, uh, you know, if, three, if 323 were prime, it would be divisible by two, four, and 16. And that seems false. <laughs> now, <laughs> right. it, it turns out that that, that the antecedent's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's not possible for 323 to be Prime. Mm. It's not obvious, but it's true. Uh, and it seems the wrong answer that that counterfactual should come out vacuously true. It, it seems mm -hmm. non vacuously false. Or here's an example of mine that I quite like. Uh, remember, Lewis believed that there are infinitely many possible worlds, and they're all real and they're, they're concrete. Infinitely many. And that, that's a key, key part of his, his book. Mm -hmm. on the plurality of worlds, his whole metaphysical picture. Okay, consider this counterfactual. If there had, if there had been 17 possible worlds, Lewis would have been exactly right in his theory. Mm -hmm. No, no, that, that's surely false. The whole point, and you know, his theory is that there are infinitely many. Right, right. <laughs> he, he, he argued about that at, at some length. But he certainly didn't think there were exactly 17 possible worlds, right? Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, that, that seems, by his lights, that's an impossible antecedent. There's no possible world at which it's true that there are 17 total possible worlds. Uh, we don't want it to come out vacuously true. Mm -hmm. So we want it yeah. to come out false, right? How, we, want, how... we want that to come out false, yep. Yeah, so how about case, oh, we're thinking about counterfactuals the whole time right now, but we're supposing that the antecedent part is true, ah, sorry, false. Yeah, right, yep. So what of, true. Yeah, what of cases wherein the antecedent is true? Excellent, good. So in a way, this, this is, so to speak, the, the opposite extreme. So far we've been talking about one extreme, you know, th there are no possible worlds at all where the antecedent is true. You, no matter how far out you go, mm. you don't find any. The opposite extreme is you don't have to leave the actual world at all because <laughs> the antecedent is already true right here, you know? This world, right. Okay. Right. Uh, and that, so that's, and by the way, this is another good philosophical heuristic, another good technique. Look at extreme cases, okay? In, when it comes to similarity, look at the most remote case, so mm. to speak, which I'm imagining is impossible. And now look at the closest case, uh, the least remote case. That's where, where the, uh, that's the actual world. Okay, so now imagine the counterfactual has a true antecedent. So according to, to Lewis, you don't have to go anywhere else. You just look at right the world. here and now is, is the antecedent's true. Mm. And it's just a matter of whether the consequent is true here in the actual world. So, so, so to put it simply, the, the counterfactual just becomes the material conditional. It right. becomes true in every, well, it, it comes true if the consequent is true, right? Mm. False if the consequence is false in the actual world. And you don't have to look at any other possible worlds near or far. Okay, so, so there's the, the schema, you know, true would true gives you true. true. Right. Okay. Well, is that true? <laughs> is, that, is that plausible? Uh, 
And look, it is, I guess, somewhat plausible that the actual world is the most similar world to itself. Of course. And, and, <laughs> and, and that, that so-called strict centering, that uh, there's mm. no other world that's as close to the actual world as itself. But uh, that seems to yield certain puzzling results uh, because there are some cases where you have true would true that are intuitively false. So for example, if there's no connection between the antecedent and the consequent mm -hmm. or, or worse, if there's actually, you know, anti-correlation, if the, if the antecedent is sort of bad news for the consequent, it's mm -hmm. like uh, counter evidence for the consequent, but they just both happen to be true. Then that seems like uh, the wrong result. Um, if, yes. So, can you can you give an example of those cases here? Yes. Yes. Sure. Uh, uh, let's. Yeah. Let's. Let's. Here's a good case. Uh, I, I I looked up a bit of geography, and I know what your uh, latitude and longitude in in Manila. <laughs> okay. <happened> to be. <laughs> Okay, so, so speaking to you, uh, you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I know mm -hmm. that, and you are at the longitude 120 degrees, uh, 58 minutes east. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that, okay, so. so the, okay. Following, the following counterfactual is true, uh, JJ. If, if you were in the Northern Hemisphere, <laughs> somewhere or other, mm -hmm you would be at exactly 120 degrees, 58 minutes east. Okay. okay. Now you might say, yeah, well, that's, that's true. Cause there you are. And there you are, you're in the Northern hemisphere and you are at that longitude, mm -hmm. but if you, you might, I have the opposite intuition, namely, look, if I were anywhere at all in the Northern hemisphere, I would be exactly at that longitude and nowhere else. Well, I don't know, you know, you so easily could be, a little bit to the side, a little bit east, a little bit west. <laughs> uh, so, so the counterfactual is making this very strong claim, it seems to me, if you're anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, you'd be exactly at that, that longitude. Uh, that comes out true, that, that's true, would true, mm -hmm. according to the Lewis, Lewis, yep. the Lewis analysis, that's just plain true mm -hmm. on its own, because the closest world is the actual world, true, true. But I, th I think there's an intuition that pulls the other way, that uh, the, uh, you, you, you shouldn't get such a specific counterfactual to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we ought to come up with a case where, uh, where um, you, you have a counter support between the antecedent and the consequent. How about this? Uh, if, if, if Trump had been losing in the polls and he defended various people and you know you know scandals about things he had said uh emerged he would have won the election well mm -hmm. <laughs> he did and he did the, the, the antecedent's true all of those things actually happened right he did actually won the election yeah the election but you might say hang on that counterfactual seems funny you know because the antecedent counter supports he won the election despite mm. all of those things you know not the counterfactual sort of suggests some positive you know connection mm. between the antecedent and the consequent not a negative one <laughs> and in, in the actual world there happened to be a negative uh connection but but both the antecedent and consequent were tr true so you might say that's that's a worry also for this uh, Lewisian analysis and Stolnacker too. I, I would have the same the same issue about mm. the, the true would true uh, yields a true counterfactual. Actually, the the last case is a, is interesting. What if the antecedent and the consequence are completely opposing each other, right? So the yep. antecedent is a counter evidence to your consequence. That's a, so that, that's that's a, yeah, that's an interesting example. That, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you've got a, a spectrum of examples. You've got maybe mm. the intuitively true ones are where the antecedent is, is positively correlated or it's good evidence for the consequent. Mm. You've got cases of just completely neutral, you know, the antecedent uh, 
sort of militates neither way in favor of the consequent right. against it. And then maybe the worst case is where it's actually negative. It's counter evidence, mm. the antecedent for the consequent, and still it comes out true according to this analysis. Okay, so, so we have seen Lewis's analysis and Stallnaker's analysis. We have seen yeah. some upshots of that view. How about the logic of counterfactuals? How about the reasoning that we have? Would Buddhist opponents turn out valid in counterfactual? Discount. That's a good place to start. That's very relevant right here, isn't it? Modus ponens will come out valid, mm -hmm. according to Stolnecker and Lewis, because uh, just to, to, for everyone to be clear, modus ponens is the uh, inference rule. Uh, if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. That's mm -hmm. meant to be valid. Mm -hmm. And so, so now consider the case where P is true in the actual world. You don't have to leave. You don't have to go to some other world. So mm -hmm. right here and now, P is the case. And if P were the case, Q would, would be the case. Yep. So, so just, just check whether, you know, in the actual world, Q is true according to the, uh, the analysis. According to our premises, it, 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 it's true. So, mm -hmm. so Q will be true in the actual world. Mm -hmm. I, I, may, I didn't maybe say that as, as well as I could have, but uh, P is true in the actual world, so you don't need to go anywhere else to check. Uh, if P then Q is true, according, it's one of the premises. Mm -hmm. So we only need to check the actual world, okay? To get your Q. And, and it's true, so mm -hmm. we, we, we can correctly conclude Q. Modus ponens comes out valid. And that seems to be a good thing because modus ponens seems very in intuitive. Right. Uh, there, another, another, I think intuitive inference rule would be let's call it agglomeration. Mm -hmm. Namely, uh, P would Q, P would R, mm -hmm. therefore P would Q and R. You can just conjoin the consequence. Yeah, that's the that consequent P, part, right? So that's. That, so let, let, let's see that. So if some antecedent condition uh, implies a consequent in the same, yeah, counterfactually and implies another uh, uh, yeah. Q as a consequent, then you have the same antecedent counterfactually yes. implying a different consequent, then the inference will be from that antecedent, you, it counterfactually implies both those consequents. That, you got it. Yeah, okay. that, that's right. That's right. And you can see why that would fall out of the Stolnecker lewis analysis too, analysis too. namely, uh, go to the, the closest P world or mm -hmm. worlds, if there, if there are many, okay, uh, Q is true at them. Mm -hmm. Also, R is true, true at them. Right. So P, so Q and R is true at mm -hmm. all of them, you know, because that, that's just, you know, closure under conjunction. At, at those worlds right so so that comes out valid and that seems good and uh so far you know the the analysis is getting ticks you know these are judgments of validity that we want upheld and they, they are upheld that's good mm -hmm. how about how about cases where we we think the argument form is invalid we, we think uh an argument of a certain schema mm -hmm. has has counter instances and there are a number of cases of, of this. Uh, we, we've all, uh, no, actually, we didn't talk about it too much. Now's a good time to talk about strengthening the antecedent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's okay. valid, right? That's valid in classical logic. Uh, it, so it, it, it is for uh, the horseshoe, you know, mm -hmm. the material conditional. It, it's true of, of uh, entailment. The thought is that it fails for counterfactuals. Now, I actually disagree with what I'm about to say. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm now channeling the orthodoxy and, and the literature, mm -hmm. and certainly Lewis and certainly Stolnacker. So they would say the following inference rule is invalid. Okay. There, there will be counter instances. Uh, P, P would R, therefore P and Q would R. Would R. So what mm. I what I just did was I strengthened the antecedent. Mm -hmm. I started with P, that would R, we're imagining, that's the premise. Now I strengthen it, P and Q. Mm -hmm. That that would R, that, that seems to be 
false. So here's an example. Uh, I've got a fragile glass. If I were to drop the glass, it would break. True. That seems true. Right. If I were to drop the glass and have it land on a soft bed of feathers, it would break. Well, no, maybe not. You know, <laughs> soft bed of feathers cushion the fall. You know, it, it, it would survive, let's imagine. Right. So that, that seems to be a, a counterexample. Now, this, this brings us to what are so-called Sobel sequences. Uh, namely, if you s repeatedly strengthen the antecedent of a counterfactual, mm -hmm. you get this sort of flip-flop pattern that the counterfactual seems maybe true initially, strengthen the antecedent, it goes false, strengthen again, it becomes true, strengthen mm -hmm. yet again, it becomes false, and, and you get this sort of alternation uh, when I was a, a, a child in primary school, we, we sometimes played this little game. I, I never realized how philosophically profound it was. Uh, someone would begin a story mm -hmm. with what, what seemed like bad news. And then the next person in the game had to add an extra detail to make it good news. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, oh, a, a guy falls out of a plane. That's bad news. That's bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ne next kid has to add an e extra detail. Oh, it's okay. He's got a parachute. <laughs> That's good news. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next kid. Now has to make it bad news again. The parachute's got a hole in it. That's bad. <laughs> okay. okay. Next kid. Next kid. Uh, he's got a second parachute. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The second parachute's got a hole in it. That's bad. Blah, blah, blah. So you, you get the idea. We're sort All of right, alternating right. Good, good news, bad news, good news, bad news. Now, what, what you might say that's displaying is, is the so-called Sobel sequence structure of counterfactuals, that if you keep on adding, adding strengthening mm. the antecedent, you will get this sort of flip-flop pattern. If, if someone, were to, someone were to fall out of a plane, that would be bad. <laughs> Yes, if he would pull out of the plane and have a parachute, that's good. It would be good. Mm -hmm. If he would have pulled out of the plane and have a parachute and have a hole in the parachute, that would be bad. Blah blah blah. So you mm. get this alternating sequence. Notice this is right there, an argument against the strict conditional, against counterfactuals being analysed as strict conditionals, because mm. strict conditionals obey strengthening the antecedent. Mm, right. So, right. So if you start with a true counterfactual and then you add a bit of extra detail to the consequent, sorry, to the antecedent, mm. uh, you'll, you'll get a, a, another true one. Uh, and and that, that's pretty obvious. If, if all of the P worlds are Q, then all of the P and R worlds are also Q, mm. you know, so to speak, all the more. Like, not only are they all, have you got all the P worlds being Q, but if you've got particular P worlds, the ones that are also R, of course they're Q. They're, they're, they're just a subset of the original ones, and you said that all of them were Q. Yeah. So, so, so the upshot there is strict conditionals obey strengthening of the antecedent. Kind they of don't, they, they, yeah, they, they obey strengthening mm. as a valid yeah. inference rule for counterfactuals. If, if if you're imagining that analysis and s allegedly Sobel sequences teach us that counterfactuals do not behave that way because they have this sort of alternating structure mm. where you, when you add extra detail to the antecedent, you can turn a true counterfactual into a false one. And this was, I would say this was Lewis's number one reason for rejecting the strict conditional Mm -hmm. analysis because he, he 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 liked this alternation of true false <laughs> true false as you successively strengthened the mm -hmm. antecedent strict conditionals don't deliver that counterfactuals mm -hmm. there can't be strict conditionals according to you is now to me they they are but uh, i we, i don't want to get ahead of myself so, so just to summarize where we're at uh, i've given you some inference patterns which intuitively are valid, like modus ponens, mm -hmm. uh, agglomeration, and the similarity account of, of Lewis and Stolnacker mm -hmm. uh, delivers those verdicts. So tick, tick. 
now we've been considering what seems to be an invalid inference rule that was strengthening the antecedent. Mm. And it'll come out invalid <coughs> according to Lewis and Stallnacker. So you might say there's another tick. Mm -hmm. uh, is that it, you don't want it to come out valid and that's what the similarity account predicts. You, you, you could easily draw a diagram to convince yourself and Lewis does in his book. Uh, just a couple of others, we won't go into the same detail on them, but uh, transitivity, you know, A would B, mm. B would C, therefore A would C, C. Mm. transitivity. Uh, it seems that that's invalid, that there are counterexamples to that. And, you know, Stallnack had, had some famous ones. And again, that is vindicated by the similarity semantics. They, that will come out invalid according to Lewis, according to Stallnack. Uh, one last one, contraposition. Mm -hmm. A would C, therefore not C would not A. Okay, so what, what, what happened there? I, I, I flipped the counterfactual and I negated. The conceptual yeah, part, right. The part, so that's contraposition. By the contraposition holds for the material conditional, it holds for the strict conditional. And you might say, here's yet another argument against those, those analyses, because intuitively, contraposition fails for counterfactuals and Again, Lewis and Stallnacker predict that it fails mm -hmm. with their similarity accounts. And so again, they, they will give themselves ticks that they're delivering the right verdicts. Now, again, the sort of uh, heterodox guy that I am, I, I disagree with that orthodoxy, but <laughs> let's set that aside. That is, that's the sort of received view. Oh, of the logic of counterfactuals. The logic of counterfactuals, here are the valid ones, valid inferences here mm. are the invalid ones and the similarity accounts are getting them all correct they're classifying them as intuition would have it mm -hmm. so that that's yeah so I'll, I'll just go back to the strengthening idea i'm, I'm thinking about monotonicity and non-monotonicity here so yeah. Yeah, is that's what it is. yeah so counter is uh lewis's counterfactual logic a kind of non-monotonic logic yeah, yeah. So you, you could say it, say it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's right. So, uh, yeah. Normally, you know, strengthening a premise mm -hmm. should, should deliver the the conclusion. You know, all the more, so to speak. But but counterfactuals have this allegedly uh, non-monotonic feature that strengthening an antecedent can turn a true counterfactual into a false one. So yeah, mon non-monotonicity is a good word for that. Okay. Okay. So, so far we discussed Lewis's account and Stallnaker's account, and we have seen the upshots of the, of the view. Now let's go to some objections against the theory. Okay. Those theories. So there's a, a, an objection given by Kit Fine. It centers on, it focuses on uh, the crucial element in both theories. Uh, it, it, it asks us about how how do you distinguish what worlds are similar and what worlds are not similar, right? So I think that the objection was something about Nixon. So here's a counterfactual. If Nixon had pushed the button, so we are in the Cold War scenario, if he had pushed yes. the button, then yes. there would be nuclear holocaust. So yes. I think that the, the objection is, so how would we distinguish between worlds that are yes. antecedent worlds that are close to that? In this Very good. Okay. Th that, that's right. So, so far we've had this crucial notion of similarity or closeness or nearness, as we've put it. Mm. And so far we, we haven't said too much about what it involves. To the extent that I did, I was assuming a sort of intuitive notion of similarity. For example, I, I used that and Lewis used it in the seven foot example. Remember the example was if I were taller than seven feet, Mm -hmm. How tall would I be? Would I be seven foot one? Well, it'd be a bit more similar to my actual height to bring me down to seven foot half an inch, seven foot quarter of an inch. That was similar, more similar. So that was a kind of, you might say, intuitive notion of similarity that's picking up on this 
you know, quantitative, quantitative notion of, of height. And then more generally, you might say, in the early days of this theorizing about counterfactuals, people like Stolnacker and Lewis were thinking of a kind of intuitive resemblance notion, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and, you know, the folk are very familiar with, you know, the notion of resemblance. Mm -hmm. It's hard to give a philosophical account of resemblance, like witness the Gru paradox, but, but at least we, we do have a pretty good idea of when things are similar to each other or less similar. And I remember I did the Britney Spears <laughs> and uh, Madonna and so on example. Intuitively, things were getting less and less similar. Okay, mm. that's the setup. And now Fine has what seems to be a killer objection to thinking of similarity intuitively like that for counterfactuals. So let's just go through the Nixon. You're quite right. It's a Nixon example. And yeah, the Cold War, there's this button hooked up to the nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nixon, thank God, never pressed the button. But if he had pressed the button, there would have been a Holocaust. We want that to come out true. Okay. That's, that's the intuitive answer. And Fine's objection is it seems to come out false, according to Lewis. Uh, let me just, I'll read Fine and then I'll, I'll say it in my words. He says, uh, if Nixon had pressed the button, there would have been a nuclear holocaust is true or can be imagined to be so. Now suppose that there never will be a, ne a nuclear holocaust then that counterfactual is on Lewis's analysis very likely false. So that's why it's a good counterexample. Mm -hmm. But given any world in which antecedent and consequent are both true, it will be easy to imagine a closer world in which the antecedent is true, but the consequent false. For we need only imagine a change that prevents the Holocaust, but that does not require such a great divergence from reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Let, let me say it in my worlds say it in my word, <laughs> words, uh, yeah, worlds, uh, holocausts make a big difference. Of course. <laughs> the world. You know, a world where there's a holocaust is not at all similar to the actual world where there is, is no holocaust, right? Holocausts make huge changes. All right. So imagine Nixon pressing the button and let's, let's imagine two different scenarios. In one version, there's a Holocaust. Huge difference, very dissimilar from the actual world. Another scenario, he presses the button and it, it just malfunctions. You know, it, it sort of fizzles out and nothing happens. And then things go on very much like before, you know, very much as normal. You know, Nixon's maybe slightly surprised, <laughs> but, but, you know, the world looks very much like the actual world from then on. Let's, let's picture it that way. Mm -hmm. So the, the big challenge to Lewis is that he seems to be making the wrong prediction. He seems to be saying that the Nixon counterfactual comes out false. Mm -hmm. Namely, if Nixon had pressed the button, there would not have been a Holocaust. Rather, there would have been a malfunction. <laughs> That's right? awesome. because that, that would have been more similar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the, the Holocaust world is, is very dissimilar. It's, it's a huge change from the actual world. Okay, so that's a very nice problem. It's a good challenge that Nixon lays before Lewis. So, so I, I think we just have to agree straight away. Uh, similarity cannot be the, the intuitive thing because... I think Nick's, the, the fine is giving the correct ordering of judgments according to intuitive similarity. Intuitively, it's more similar that the button fizzles, malfunctions, and then things go on more or less as before. Mm -hmm. That's more similar than the huge changes from a Holocaust. Okay. All right. So then Lewis responds and he, he takes that on board. He says, right, similarity is not just the intuitive thing. Okay. So he has to do some well, contortions to make sure that he, he comes out with the right answer for the Nixon uh, counterfactual, that it comes out true. It, it would be a little bit complicated here, you know, just, just in our interview to, 
to go through all of those details, mm. but I can summarize where he gets to. He, he says, similarity for counterfactuals is not the familiar intuitive thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's related to that, but it's not exactly that. Rather, it obeys this certain order of priorities of what matters. And then he tells us, uh, we could read it properly in a moment, but basically avoid miracles, big miracles, avoid big violations of the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. And then that's the first priority. Then as much as possible, maximize agreement with particular facts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then minimize miracles at all, even small miracles, which are violations of laws of nature. And then when it comes to approximate match of particular facts, well, he's not completely clear on whether that matters or not. It, it's of little or no importance, he says. So uh, on the handout, if, if, if you, your students have it, I, I quoted him where he gives this system of priorities, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. you know, above mm -hmm. all, uh, as he says, it is of the first importance to avoid big, widespread, diverse violations of law, or, or said succinctly, avoid big miracles. And then it is of the second importance to maximize the spatio-temporal region throughout which perfect match of particular fact prevails. So it's of the second importance to get, get the facts mm -hmm. the same, right? And then the third is avoid small miracles. And then the fourth is it, it's of little or no importance to, to get the facts approximately right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that Lewis argues that if you follow that priority system, he'll get the right result on the Nixon counterfactual. It'll come out true. It, 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 again, as I say, it's somewhat complicated to sort of talk through it about, you know, bigger and smaller miracles. But, mm -hmm. but we, we, can, we can trust him that uh, he, he gets the right answer on the, on the Nixon case. But I, I want to make a, a, a couple of points. His whole system of priorities is calculated to fit the Nixon case, you know, because he, he's, he's really concerned about whether, you know, the, the button fizzles or would the, would the mm -hmm. past have been different and blah, blah, blah. So he... he he's taking that as a data point and then he's he's trying to fit his theory to it mm -hmm. but then he moves on it, it's it's actually i find this rather funny in 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 that paper it's called uh time counterfactual dependence and time's arrow where he mm -hmm. does this similarity ordering mm -hmm. he he goes through the nixon example and he gives his system of priorities like straight away he's done it seems a little odd. He's, he's looking at one data point, you know, the Nixon case, mm -hmm. and then he fashions his whole system around it. You're kind of expecting, well, surely there's a further paragraph where he says, oh, and the Nixon example is typical, you know, throw your favorite example at me and this same system of ordering will, will do the job. Mm. He never says that. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe it was so obvious he didn't need to say it. He felt he didn't need to say it. But I... I, I, I feel like saying, well, hang on, no, maybe you got the Nixon case right, but there'll be all these other cases that'll go wrong mm -hmm. if you use that similarity ordering. Let me give you one, and then, oh, sorry, I've talked a lot. I'll let, let, let you, let, we'll go back to you. Uh, consider this counterfactual. Uh, I didn't scratch my finger yesterday. That's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, I'd scratched, if I'd scratched my finger yesterday, I would have done so at midnight, you know, as late as possible in the day, not earlier, mm -hmm. I would have scratched my finger at midnight. Now that I hope sounds false to you. That why midnight? What? <laughs> what why so why specific? Is, what's, what's so specific? Why specifically midnight? Right. right. <laughs> but, but that seems to come out true on the yeah. Lewis mm. ordering. Now, that, why is that? Now, we don't need any big miracles to, to have me scratch my finger yesterday. Mm -hmm. so, so then the second priority kicks in, namely, he says, maximize... The spatial temporal region, the facts. Region, right. the perfect, perfect match. 
Mm -hmm. what, what that's going to mean in this case is that we, we want to maximize all of the, the perfect match of the actual world. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it'll turn out we get that by delaying my scratch as late as possible. Remember, I did not scratch yesterday. Mm -hmm. So if, if we make my scratch earlier in the day, you know, that's not as big a match of perfect, perfect match of history as if we postpone it, you know, to as late as possible. Ah, in fact, let's make it midnight. Let, let, let that be the last moment of yesterday. That way we will get the most perfect match of history. Nothing changed until right at the end. <laughs> and, then, and then I scratched. That'll come out true, it seems, on Lewis's account. And I think that's a bad result. Answer. Right, right, right. Bad result. In fact, to make it even worse, let, let's suppose that I'm more likely to scratch early in the day. You know, like I wake up itchy. And so I, that's when I tend to scratch, you know. And then as the day progresses, I become less and less likely to scratch. And let, in fact, midnight is the most unlikely time for me to scratch my finger. Okay. But still, according to Lewis, it seems, it's true that that's when I would have scratched. I would have scratched at midnight. I would have scratched at the most unlikely time mm -hmm. because that's the time that would maximize the perfect match of history. And that seems to me like a very bad result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so JJ, I've talked a bit too much. I, I should go back no. to you, but this was to convey to you a couple of things. This was how Lewis responds to Fine's objection Similarity is not just intuitive, it's this slightly, you know, quasi-technical mm. notion involving miracles and so on with an ordering of what matters. And then I claim he fashioned that to handle the Nixon case, but that's just one data point. And I think I can come up with other cases where that ordering goes wrong. Right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about the fine objection. And I think the main objection is how do we distinguish between what's similar, the worlds, the antecedent worlds that we need to consider in our analysis. Now, yeah. Lewis will come in and say, well, the similarity relation could be cashed out in terms of here's our policy for that. So don't look at worlds which are, de are deviating from our actual world too much, like no big miracles. No, no violations of laws of nature and so on. So that guarantees that if I follow these principles or policies for yep. checking my my yep. A worlds, uh, I would yep. get my right and uh, I would get the correct analysis. I think that that's right. But you're saying that even if we follow Lewis's yep. policy yep. of checking the worlds, uh, we will get into some commonsensical bad results, like the stra so. scratching of the finger and so on. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun objection, by the way. How about, how about your claim? You're, uh, <laughs> you've been doing this for almost, I, I, don't, I don't know how long, but you have been claiming that most counterfactuals are false. Yeah, now can you right. give us a, just yeah, a, a background of what's going on there? A any opportunity. <laughs> and, and by the way, just, just for a bit of fun, remember much earlier I, I talked about regret and I said how I'm prone to regret. Mm -hmm. And when I psychoanalyze myself, sometimes I think uh, this, is, this is why I want most counterfactuals to come out false because I, I, those counterfactuals that inform my regret, if, if they were false, I could make them go away. <laughs> but, uh, that, that's, that's partially a joke, but, it, yeah. uh, no, but I, I am serious. I do think most counterfactuals are false. And let, let me go, go through a couple of my main reasons. Now, in a way, this involves me taking back almost everything I've said up to now, because what I was presenting was orthodoxy. It's mm -hmm. what, you know, the, the Stolnacker Lewis tradition thinks and, you know, what, what has become the received view about counterfactuals. So I'm flying in the face of all of that. But here's what I think. Uh, Maybe this is the easiest way to, to make the point. Uh, consider, say, a toss of a coin. And start with a coin toss. Oh, I will never toss the coin. Oh, but if I were to toss the coin, it would land heads. 
right? It would land heads, not tails. It would land heads. No, that was a joke. That, 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 <laughs> I mean, why, why heads? <laughs> it's a little bit like Bizet and Verdi would be French, not Italian. Okay, actually, we'll, maybe we'll do that in a moment. But, but yeah, look, I, I think it's a chancy coin. And the counterfactual was second guessing the outcome of this chancy process. Mm -hmm. This chancy process would have wound up the head's way, not the tail's way. No, I, I think that's misunderstanding chance. The whole point of chance is that it's, it's open which way things would go. So you don't want to have a counterfactual telling you it would go one way, not the, the other. other. Yep. That's false. Okay. That you were probably imagining a fair coin. Doesn't have to be a fair coin. Now make it highly biased, highly biased to heads. 99% chance of heads, 1% mm -hmm. chance of tails. If I were to toss the coin, it would land heads. No, I still say no. Because there's a 1% chance. 1% yeah. chance. <laughs> okay. The coin, the coin might land tails. Mm -hmm. So another way of my putting the same point is, remember Lewis had this duality between might and would. Remember, mm -hmm. might not entailed not would. Okay, it was a lot, a lot like necessity and possibility. So I, I said back then, might counterfactuals are very easy to make true. Well, they render false the corresponding woulds. Let, let's do it. If I were to toss the coin, it might land tails. I think that's obviously true. But I say that contradicts. It would land heads. So I, I feel like saying, make up your mind. <laughs> if you yeah. say the coin would land heads, then don't say it, it might not. It might land tails. Okay. So th this is very much in keeping with that Lewis opposition between would might and might not and would. Yep, yep. Now, okay. So, uh, so Lewis would have to deny that the might conditional is true in this case. But uh, I say, of course it's true because there's a positive chance. Okay. So that, that was the, the coin, which I've now made a, a biased coin. And now to, to finish the argument, because remember, <coughs> it isn't just most counterfactuals about coins or something. It's about in general. Most counterfactuals, generally. Most counterfactuals are false in general. <laughs> Well, it's because they're chancy, most of them. Mm -hmm. uh, physics teaches us that our world is a chancy place. You know, start with quantum mechanics, but it, it, it sort of percolates up from that. So what we normally think of as, you know, deterministic or guaranteed uh, outcomes are not really. They're really, I say, chancy. Uh, we learn that from physics. Okay, so take something that you think is deterministic and not chancy. So here, here we go. I've got my, my iPhone. I will not drop the phone. In fact, I'll put it, put it away. <laughs> but if I, were, if I were to drop the phone, it would fall. Mm -hmm. That seems to be true. That, that's about as true as they get. I mean, counterfactuals aren't much more intuitively true than that. I say, no, it's still false. There's a chance. <laughs> Of the, of the phone not falling. Mm -hmm. but various weird things could happen, like uh, there could be a sudden updraft of wind that lifts the phone, mm -hmm. it doesn't fall. Uh, if we could go crazier still, you know, the quantum mechanics tells us, it seems, there's some chance of the, co of the I keep saying coin, the phone doing some really <laughs> weird thing, like quantum tunneling mm -hmm. in China. Very, very unlikely. I know that, but there's a chance of it happening. So I think of these normal processes as really being like lotteries. We don't think of them that way normally, but it's actually a lottery. What happens to the phone if I let go of it? It's very probable that it falls. Like almost every ticket in the lottery has it falling, but there are some anomalous tickets in the lottery where it, it gets blown upwards by an updraft or, you know, some crazy quantum event <laughs> happens or, you know, it, 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 it vaporizes spontaneously. Uh, 
I, I know that's unlikely. It's extremely unlikely, but still it might happen. And mm. so just consider, consider a lottery, a, a huge lottery. You know, let, let's say it's got a, a billion tickets or a trillion tickets or a Google number of well, tickets. Mm. If that lottery were played, ticket number one would lose. I say, well, no, it might win. It's very unlikely, but it might win. Mm -hmm. In fact, you, you'd better not say, you'd better not say that ticket number one would lose. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if, if you say that, then you'd better say, well, ticket number two would lose. It's got the same chance. Ticket number three would lose, has the same chance. Dot, dot, dot. Therefore, every ticket would lose. Then if the have... lottery was played, every ticket would lose. Mm -hmm. But hang on, that's wrong. We know that's wrong. Some ticket would win. There would be a winning ticket mm -hmm. in the lottery. You've contradicted yourself. The so lottery paradox. It, it's very much like the lottery paradox. It's, right. it's like a, a paradox for conditionals. In this case, it's agglomeration, what I called agglomeration earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, all I did was agglomerated the consequence. If I were to, if the lottery were played, ticket number one would lose and ticket number two would lose and three would lose and, and, and all the way to the last ticket. No, no <laughs> one thinks that because some ticket would win. Okay, so I'm appealing to a couple of things. I'm appealing to the logic, uh, like I like agglomeration. Mm -hmm. I'm appealing to might nots contradict woulds. And I say that the ticket might win. Okay, so that's how I handle the really huge lottery. Mm -hmm. I say it's false that the ticket number one would lose. It's false that ticket number two would lose. They might win. And so it is with the phone. It's like a lottery with a huge number of tickets. Most of them correspond to the phone falling normally. I know mm -hmm. that. But there's a small number of tickets. It's a, it's a lottery. <laughs> where something weird, where something weird happens that's why it's false that the phone would fall if it were dropped it well, might not uh, i have to say this but i think that you're appealing to another principle a kind of regularity principle right so mm -hmm. if something's possible or it might be the case then there's a likelihood that it will be the case i i, I am making a connection between positive probability and might mm -hmm. uh, if something if something has positive chance, then it might happen. Mm -hmm. but okay. I, but that, that, that seems to me very intuitive. Like, like forget about counterfactuals. Just, just think about, say, lotteries in the future. You know, I, 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 have, I have bought a ticket in this huge lottery. My ticket might win, I mm -hmm. say. That, that seems just true. Uh, and it's true even though I know it's extremely improbable. But the point is, it has some positive probability. I have, I have some chance of winning. I claim it follows from that, that I might win. And, and this, is, this is might in the sort of deep metaphysical sense. It's not just my... my it's epistemic. Epistemic. Right, right. It's, the world is such that the, it's, it's true of, of my ticket, that it might win because mm. it has a positive chance of winning. So I think that's a very plausible principle too. And then I appeal to a counterpart of that for the would might counterfactuals. Okay. So finally, so what's your advice to our students who are working on some topics in philosophy? Why should they be interested in counterfactuals? And how would Oh yeah. 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 Uh, so look look at the people who are interested in it. <laughs> Me. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> That, that, that gets the order of explanation the wrong way around. Look, why, why were these people and why are so many philosophers interested in counterfactuals? Uh, remember that long list I gave you more or less at the beginning mm -hmm. of how counterfactuals are implicated in, in so much other stuff. Here's how I would put it. You can often think of philosophical topics like stations on a subway network. You know, uh, do, do you, you certainly have a rail network. Do you have a subway network in Manila? I no, can't just, remember. yeah, just a train system. Train, train system. So let, it doesn't have to be subway. There you go. Yeah, You've got a train system and think of a, a map of the train stations 
and you've got a sort of grand central station. I don't know what you call it in Manila, but mm. uh, you know, you've got, you've got a main station, and you know, lots of lots of railway lines come out of that station. I sometimes think you can you can picture philosophy a bit that way. That there are all these philosophical topics, but there are certain you know central stations, mm -hmm. and then there are connections you know easily made from these central stations. Now it depends on your philosophical inclination what your grand central station or stations will be. You know, for some people it might be consciousness, for example, that might be a, mm -hmm. a central station. Well, for me. My, my central stations are probability and conditionals. And I, I reckon from both of those topics, you very quickly get to so many other topics, you know, mm -hmm. with very few transfers, as we might say, you know, to <laughs> the analogy, okay? Mm -hmm. So I've said a bit about probability, but let's focus on the conditionals. Uh, I gave you all of these other topics, you know, dispositions, explanations, laws of nature, causation, rational decision, blah, blah, blah. So to speak, they're all just one stop away from conditionals. Mm, right. And, and in particular, in this case, counterfactuals, that, you know, so many people analyze these other things directly in terms of counterfactuals. So you'd better understand counterfactuals pretty well <laughs> okay. if you if you want to understand these other things in terms of them. And uh, actually, this, this raises an interesting issue. I finished with saying, I think most counterfactuals are false. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now I'm saying that there are all of these analyses in terms of counterfactuals. Right. We, we talked about Lewis on causation, that that's what started that whole mm. enterprise for him earlier. And so now there's a bit of a dilemma, maybe a dilemma for me, uh, so do I think that there is no such thing as causation or very little causation in mm -hmm. the world because I think the counterfactuals he uses are false or do I think no one ever made a rational decision because the counterfactuals involved in rational decision making are false mm -hmm. or do I think there's no such thing as knowledge because people analyze knowledge in terms of counterfactuals. There are no dispositions. Nothing was fragile, for example, because people analyze dispositions in terms of counterfactuals. Lewis also did, by the way, and so on. So now, now I'm sounding even crazier, perhaps. You know, not only do I think all of these counterfactuals that common sense regards as true, I, I, I regard as false, but now I'm eliminating from the world, you know, causation and dispositions and knowledge and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, I, I think that tells us that there's something wrong with these analyses. You shouldn't just analyze counterfactuals. Sorry, you shouldn't analyze causation or knowledge or dispositions, blah, blah, blah. In terms of counterfactuals. In, in terms of bare counterfactuals, you know, just P would Q, things mm. of that form. The truth, I think, is something sort of in the neighborhood, but it's a little different. It's like prob probabilified counterfactuals, like would probably. Mm. That, they, they could come out true. If I were to let go of the phone, it, it would probably fall. That's true, but that's not what I originally said. I said it would fall and that's false. So adding the probably makes all the difference. So I think these analyses might come out correct if you just probabilify them. You, you, you get rid of the bare would counterfactuals and you replace them with something like would probably. That, that's a whole longer story for another day, but, but that's, that's my sort of more considered opinion. Mm -hmm about how to handle these counterfactuals. But to, to just to re repeat my answer to your question, you asked why, why should students care about counterfactuals? Uh, because they're grand central station. <laughs> <laughs> right. At least for me and for a lot of people that they, they figure so centrally in so much of philosophy, uh, whether or not you agree with these analyses, you, you really need to understand counterfactuals uh, and their interrelations with these, all, these various topics uh, to, to have a good handle on so much of these areas of philosophy. Okay, so thanks for your answer and that answer interview. Um, pleasure. Thank you, Al. Nice, nice to see you, JJ. Nice to continue the friendship. Uh,
uh, for 10 years. years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to the day when it won't have to be at such a distance. Right. See you, Al.